It is Friday, and I am so tired of thinking and so tired of being substantive. Fortunately, we don't have to do that anymore. We're going to do an installment of Friday Release Valve, where we talk about the underserved headlines of the week and probably the funnier headlines of the week. And I am rejoined this week by two guests that I very much enjoyed talking to you previously. I've got Mike Kaplan, who came on Alienating the Audience, the sci-fi corollary to this. Mike, uh, welcome to the Political Orphanage, and uh, thanks for coming on and being funny. I am happy to be here. I can only confirm that I've been funny in the past uh, and no one knows the future. That spot on. And I, I should note, uh, you had an album come out uh, recently and, and it is it is available for consumption of people that like funny things. Oh, yeah. This the album is called A.K.A. And I recorded it a year ago when uh, live audiences existed. Right. I remember and that. I'm very grateful to have done that and that it was the the sum total of i've been doing comedy for about 18 years and uh so this is the the culmination of all my recorded content that is available it is the content that i am most content with i think okay. it is right. uh, i'm happy with it i'm proud of it and as much as i can confirm that i have been funny this is the best example of it that i can offer perfect all right and dr danigal goldthwaite young you came on about three months ago to talk about your book, Irony and Outrage. You were very thoughtful, so smart. And by the end of the interview, I was like, she's also really funny. And so Thank I was like, you. I'm just going to bring you on as a comedian. I'm going I'm to just Thank have her you. come out and be amusing. I like it. Just don't tell any of my colleagues in academia because they will remove my street cred and take away my tenure. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? You can actually call me Dana because okay. it feels more conducive to this environment. Thank you. And I'm also probably mispronouncing your name anyway. So you are, but yeah, I, yeah but Dana's good. <laughs> may, may, may I ask two quick questions of you, Dana? Yeah. Uh, I, I studied linguistics. And I, I learned, I have a joke about uh, a different, a doctor with a complex name that I enjoy uh, that I want to ask you, can you pronounce your full name for me and also tell me what your field of study is? Dr. Danigal Goldthwaite Young, Associate Professor of Communication and Political Science at the University of Delaware. I love it. Uh, can I can I tell you briefly my my fun jokey thought? What if about I said no now? Wouldn't that, uh, that be everything? I I want we take everyone a to cons I want people to consent to my comedy. This is a political show, <laughs> oh, so I, I think like dem that. democracy makes sense. So if if I want to do it, so if either one of you wants me to, then I think it's only yes, fair. You, and, you and, may and touch I, my phone. I want to watch, no. but only if both parties are consenting. Yes. Fair enough. Okay. Consented. Uh, uh, real quick, the idea is just uh, I read that there was a a doctor at MIT named Stephanie Shattuck hyphen Huffnagel. And her field of study, the reason I read about her was that she was on a team that determined what the world's toughest tongue twister was. And it was not her own name. It was, I think, pad, cur pad kid poured curd pulled cod, which doesn't sound as hard to say, but fast over and over again it is but i thought it's amazing that this is this why this woman went into this topic this field of study to be like i need to find out a way to make it so that this never happens to anyone ever again <laughs> uh, i will kick it to our first headline and i will i will preface this actually this is a great intersection for talking about consent and uh planning um if you're going to hire a couple of guys for a sex fetish type thing that involves your fetish is them breaking into your house with machetes to threaten you. If that's what you want, if you're going to do that, remember to give them your current address. Don't give them your old address because the headline is men hired for sexual fantasy break into wrong house. This happened in Australia. Uh, two guys were hired to break into a house with machetes. And then I think they were going to like broom a guy or spank a guy with a broom or something, except he he hired them and then either decided he didn't want to use them anymore and he forgot to tell them about it or he gave them the wrong address. Either way, they broke into the wrong house and had what I have to assume was a very awkward Australian variant of an Abbott and Costello routine where they were going, uh, the, the one guy's going like, I, I didn't hire you. And they're like, yeah, we know that's what you're, what you're going to say in this fantasy, of course. Uh, and I don't like, it would be, it would be a hard feedback loop to get out of. What yeah. is the safe word? <laughs> yeah, <that's> what <laughs> is the safe 
for it. I don't know. <laughs> get, yeah, this get, is... get the address right and have a safe word. That's my advice for today. I think it's an important point that in the details of the story that you provided, that you shared, uh, thankfully, earlier, it says the client moved to another address 30 miles away without updating the two men. They entered a home on... They entered a home on the street of the original address, so I'm not even sure that part is unclear. Did they enter the the one that he had given them or a different house altogether? But either, let's say they went to the house that was his house but isn't anymore. I feel like that is it's certainly on the person. Like, that's, oh, I forgot, oh, the, the bills all, I didn't forward all of the mail. But, uh, I, I, I mean, I feel like I'm forgetting. It's like Home Alone, <laughs> but with much higher stakes. Like, that he's like, you know, like, uh, what, what's her name? Catherine O'Hara on the plane, and her eyes open wide. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 620, and he see bolts up right and goes, oh, no. Uh, I So, well, I think the, the greatest response possible to this would have been if they'd broken into some guy's house with, with machetes, and the current occupant of the house like without breaking a sweat looks up and's like ah bet you're here for Derek huh and uh, <laughs> he's like yeah yeah it's, <laughs> man, I, I, I really should leave a card at the window this happens all the time you know here's here's the one thing that I thought the one the only one thing I thought was weird about this was so you know you hear about fetishes and like people dressing up in like nurses costumes or like um, animals but this was like this person had requested gentle strokes of a broom across their naked body which is like is this like a fetish like they're imagining that they're like a cobwebbed front porch like i do not understand how, what does that bring you maybe maybe that there's like just a subtle connection between a clean house and an erection oh. and oh, uh for sure and, and if you can figure out how to rig your brain to be aroused by house cleaning, that seems like a pro, like a like a good anything move. Anything can be anything can be classically conditioned. You know? Yeah. For me, this story is one of like uh, the uh, the uh, without the mistake that's the person who knows that they love being stroked with a broom. Like I don't know if you could just buy if you fell in love with a person like that, maybe you would come to love it as well. But on your own, if you're like maybe I think I would, if you're thinking maybe I think I would like to be stroked with a broom in a gentle way, then perhaps you all. It's just igniting, lighting up the fetish that already existed within you. Is it creating it or is it discovering it? But I, whatever it is for this person, I'm glad that they know what they want. They know <laughs> what they like very specifically. If only we could all know exactly how we like to be treated and ask for it. I think that is a beautiful part of the story. The huge the huge question at the heart of this, though, is, you know, the judge ended up saying that the client was willing to pay five thousand dollars if the performance was quote really good. Did they get the five thousand dollars? <laughs> I think right? they, like maybe this was the setup. He oh yeah he I mean at the very least he should give them uh, like a kill fee at the very very least because well, they did know, they did go through with they, it. Did you read the end of the article where the client cooked bacon eggs and noodles? For, I guess, the two guys who had broken in, which I don't understand <laughs> at all. But, like, let, never mind that he then feeds them breakfast. Who has noodles for breakfast? Yeah, that guy's the weirdo, in my opinion. Totally weird. <laughs> the guy don't with, trust the noodles. The guy, guy with the noodles there. Uh, I will, uh, on my end, I am going to try a variety of interesting scenarios with various household objects later today just to see if there are any particular fetishes that I'm unaware of. And I uh, encourage everyone at home to do that in clean house. So so we're gonna we're gonna stay with the we're gonna stay with the topic of sex, but we are going to move to the policy end of it rather than the anecdotal end. Uh, and I'll say this comes to us from a, a, a listener sent this to me. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, sex workers offer to limit customers to two positions, which minimize the risk of transmitting coronavirus to enable brothels to end lockdown in Switzerland. So um, as to, to frame this, if anybody's unfamiliar with it, uh, prostitution is legal in Switzerland. Uh, human trafficking is not, pimps are not, but prostitution is legal. They shut it down in Switzerland as an effort to flatten the curve and stop, uh, uh, stop transmission. It is clearly hit the prostitution industry. And so the local association of, of sex workers has uh, come together and come up with uh, positions which minimize mouth on mouth contact, which I, I believe they spell it out in here. It's uh, I think it's doggy style and uh, and reverse, reverse cowgirl. cowgirl. I can't yeah, reverse cowgirl. Right. And my just my initial thoughts on this are uh, I, I, there were a couple of things in here. One, they, they were like, well, the, the, the Swiss government was thinking about trying to maintain better customer contact data 
with uh, with with the sex workers in order to. And I was like, I get it. But but just as an American, this strikes me as like an NSA blackmail list. This just strikes me as there's no way that's going to be used properly. Um, and then the other thing is they, they were there were all of these directions in there. Some of them were like, uh, uh, you know, you should change the sheets every time, which you should be doing already, in my humble opinion. Uh, like, these are just best practices. Uh, but beyond that, I was like, are the Swiss just having very perfunctory, very, like, matter-of-fact, handshake-style sex that they can – because it seems to me that you're probably going to get – you're going to be a vector either way is what I'm saying. Is I, 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 don't, I don't think that you're very likely to mitigate this. That's my thought. But I'm not a sex doctor. At one point, it, sa- it says that the uh, there are, in terms of these guidelines that they have to follow, one of them actually says that you should really avoid any, not just contact face to face, but you it advises workers against touching of personal belongings like uh-huh. jackets. So it's like. <laughs> So, yes, continue to have random sex with strangers of questionable origin and hygiene habits, but don't do anything really disgusting like touch their jacket. Right. Yeah. You could touch that, their member, but their jacket is off limits. Their well, jacket, because who knows if, where that jacket has been? If I may, uh, it, it could have been at a prostitution brothel. That there ought be uh, on a member a condom and also gloves like so that there actually is minimizing skin to skin contact and minimizing contact with surfaces that would have the virus. I surprise. I love this story. I think it's perfect. Uh, Like, I mean, I think it's great because prostitution like sex is essential. Sex is for many people an essential part of life. And if you don't have a partner like there's research that shows, I believe, in America where the porn laws have like come and go in different places in in some geographic areas where porn is more available or where per- perhaps prostitution has been legalized as well, uh, there is less assault. There is less domestic violence. There is less sexual violence because there are people who are not being repressed. There are people who are not being uh, not not have this be unavailable to them. And then it comes out, you know, you repress something, it comes out in sometimes different and violent and, you know, non-consensual ways. So I feel like this is a responsible thing for the, the Swiss government to want to have it be like, we want everyone to be safe and get to do what they want consensually with others, with their it, loved ones, if you have them, or, you know, uh, a business person, if you I, don't have. I, a- I want the restrictiveness of sex laws in a country to be directly proportional to the amount of sex I am having. So right mm-hmm. now, as a single person on lockdown, I think we should just ban sex for everybody. That is my opinion. And then here come hopefully a few weeks where me and the other extroverts just get like silly drunk and make out new orleans then you can all start banging again that's my Wait, proposition so can i just following mike's logic so what you're saying is that it, if i'm following this through correctly that in switzerland not only is it a result of the fact that they have really strict gun laws that reduces the violent crime but also these incels are no longer incels right they're I 100 percent think that that is correct, that uh, it is both eliminating like the causes for it's uh, it's eliminating violence by not having the opportunity with gun laws. And it's also eliminating the desire for violence by not only eliminating violence, but increasing uh, available pleasure. I like it. In theory, let's say that I wanted to be proactive about this and I were running for office. If I made a point of my plan, we're going to have sex vouchers. Where we we provide you coupons for brothels. This is so libertarian. <laughs> this is so for like charter sex schools. No, D- D- Dana, I know libertarians very well. They would never have subsidies uh, for <laughs> for anything. That is, this is this is if anything like center left, uh, like like Norwegian liberalism uh, of of where yeah, if you are going to take uh, sex coupons, everybody gets the sex coupons, and we think that that will result in more orgasms and that will decline crime. Like I could run for prime minister of Denmark right now based on this i mean i think that you're saying it all with a jokey tone but everything that you said on paper (laughs) makes sense you're trying to make fun of it you also are both overlooking what is the most important piece of this and the reason that you're overlooking it is because you're both male Uh uh-huh do you realize it says here gloves condoms and disinfectants would be provided right and that all the sessions should be kept to no longer than 15 minutes at which point 
which is three every times longer woman. than I usually go. So what's the problem here? <laughs> every it's... woman wrote back to that HR email and said, thanks for nothing, Brad, <laughs> or Jake, <laughs> or that Chad. Yeah, good point. Man, it usually takes me a good 48 minutes or so before I can even get sufficiently warmed up. And uh, I mean, the most important thing is my partner's pleasure. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send that as a calling card. All very good points. Uh, I will, I'll, I'll jump to the next story. Grimes is selling a piece of her soul in debut online art exhibit. Um, so I did not know this, but Grimes is Elon Musk's girlfriend. She's a performance artist of some type. I honestly don't know if she is a... Like she's a, a musician. Uh, she's a musician. Okay, she's a, oh, yeah. a musician. And Her music's great. It's really cool. Nice. Uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, she is in Los Angeles uh, as part of her debut album, selling a piece of her soul. And I read that and I was like, this seems like a Twilight Zone episode designed to make the devil uncomfortable. Where like the devil shows up to trick her into getting her soul. And then she's like, you could just bid on it. And he's like, oh, I, ooh, I don't know. I, 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 I thought I was going to have to pussyfoot around for a good 15 minutes before before I managed to do this. I, I What I think she needs to do is I thought about this. If you're going to sell your soul or you're going to sell a portion of your soul, just make sure that you maintain uh, the, the voting majority of your soul. Only sell up to 49% of your soul. You don't want to be in a position where there's a corporate takeover. Uh, you you, you want to make sure you've got the voting interests. That's really funny. And also, I think, uh, like, honestly, this story to me, like, as a, I'm a comedian, I think that comedy is art. I know that it's weird as a comedian to say I'm an artist. If you're like, I'm an artist, what kind? Painter, sculptor? I do uh, art of comedy. It's a, we have a different <laughs> word for it. Uh, we're like, oh, I'm a comedian. But I do think that every artist, every comedian, every musician, anyone who creates, like you are like p coming from, like if it's not, unless you're painting a house, like that's not coming necessarily from your quote unquote soul necessarily. Or maybe it is because maybe everything that we do, if you, if you believe in, a soul, the soul, like everything that we are doing is like we are running out of time or we're using the time, we're using our energy, everything that we're doing. If we're selling our art, we are selling. It's all a piece. Every part of our life, every piece of art is a piece of our soul. So I think this is like a clever marketing thing where she's like, I'm do I'm saying what I'm doing explicitly. And it's what we've all been doing. Like on Mike, Mad Men Mike, once. You, Mike, you yeah. so sound to me like a guy that has sold 800% of his soul and is trying to explain why he defrauded investors in the Ooh, soul market. I'm, either that or he's like a member of Amway. I mean, <laughs> I'm doing, uh, you think that I'm doing like the equivalent of uh, the producer? Exactly. Where I, think, like, I think that I, is, that is exactly what I think you're doing, Mike, is I, I think you're trying to explain how, how you, you sold that many soul parts. And you don't have that many soul parts. I mean, I, what you're saying, that is a very funny joke, and I understand that we're here to make very funny jokes, <laughs> but also, and also, and I'm making a funny joke by pointing out your funny joke, Thank which you. demonstrates that saying the true belief that I have can be a joke as well, and I would just add that it's impossible to sell more than you have. I mean, that's certainly what, what countries or governments or, uh, or organizations, like, it, it, in reality, like you cannot, you cannot, you can get more money, but especially when it's time and energy and effort of one human being, like I could ask people for more money. Like I'm a, I'm a comedian. I put out an album and I'm like, please listen to my album and like, you know, download it for money, stream it. And I get some money like it all. I do get money for having created the thing and I created it and I'm done creating it. And people get to keep buying it because it's, it's now out there as infinitely as possible possible but i like i i only did it once i only had to like it's impossible for me to give away more than i have can i just can, can i just call bullshit on all of this <laughs> go ahead i am so sorry mike but this is a pile of horse shit because you know what this is my mom is god bless her she's 80 years old and she always tells this story about how when she was about 10 years old which would have been in the late 1940s i guess they there was this um cereal company that had this offer where if you send in some cereal box tops and two dollars you would be able to own one square foot of land in Siberia. Mm. And so she did it and she paid the money and she has a deed to one square foot of land in Siberia. This is the same shit, right? Because you'll ne you're never gonna see the thing you bought. You're never going to experience the thing you bought. And that thing doesn't even exist.
Yeah, I don't believe in Siberia. I think it's a hoax. Siberia, it's, it's, it's the Easter Bunny. <laughs> yeah. If I may, I do think that Siberia is more real than the Easter Bunny. I do understand the the overall point that you're making. I mean, there are bunnies and they exist on Easter, so there you go. They are equally existent. But here is the thing that does exist in that experience, in an experience where somebody purchases, you know, for a dollar or whatever it is. Like, I don't think, like, you know, the free market, Andrew, I think you'd be into this. Like, I, I'm a big free market proponent. People don't have to buy it. If she's offering to sell it, if somebody wants to buy it for whatever price they want to, if they're not getting, if they're getting a deed, if they're getting something that she created, a piece of paper, they're getting a piece of art and they're getting the feeling that the experience gives them. They have, that is real. When you've purchased land in Siberia, you have emotion. It's all your consciousness. It's all your emotions. And so just to to conclude the, I, I mentioned this thing from Mad Men that uh, in like the first season they're working for like a uh, a cigarette company and they're like you should tell them that it's like warm and filtered or i don't know what, know what it was and they're like but everyone's cigarettes are warm and filtered and they're like yeah yeah yeah. but you'll be the first one to say it and then everyone else will be catching up with you and be like oh that's what i'm i'm doing that too and like so part of C Stephen Sondheim has said that life is about creating order from chaos. It's like there is chaos and it's all about like what is there and what can we call it? And if somebody finds value, it like here's one other thing. I years ago, Mike, I would I would so love to see you in a Matlock reboot where you're <laughs> you're the defense attorney that comes in. But instead oh, of like I, a charming Southern lawyer, you've read a lot of Tony Robbins and a lot of spiritual tomes and drank a pot of coffee and they just and the fling defendant, you. <laughs> the defendant proceeds to get shit faced at the table while they watch you. Like, oh, I yeah. am so screwed. <laughs> All right, I'm going to kick it to the next headline. Woman sprays Santa Rosa police officers with glitter after car chase. A woman who showered, uh, who, I'm excuse me, showered Santa Rosa police officers and cars driving by on Highway 101 with glitter was arrested on Wednesday after leading authorities on a car chase that reached speeds of 80 miles an hour. Um, cutting through this, it's a homeless lady. She stole a car. Um, stuff started falling out of the back of the car, I think, which is what alerted cops. They chased her, and then when she came out, she put glitter and I think they said like a hair dryer or a blow gun, and she blasted it at them and covered them with glitter. And I thought this is the most pleasant story involving police and high speed chases that I can think of over the last three months of how did this end? A lady threw glitter at people. Nobody got shot. Nobody died. Just glitter. Well done. This story. Well done. This lady. Well you done. Know, this lady. I, I don't think it was a hair dryer. I think it says it was a cordless blower motor. And I like a leaf blower. I, I'm not exactly. Yeah. Like a leaf blower. And I got the sense that like it was, uh, this is my reading that it was like pre-packed with glitter, which I don't fully understand. Maybe yeah, that's I not how that you wrong. buy leaf blowers for sure. I don't think they usually put in glitter, even on a birthday. But in my, in my imagination, I thought that this is literally a leaf blower that is already packed with glitter. And I thought, well, what else could possibly be in that trailer? Like a giant glue stick and like <laughs> popsicle sticks the size of two by fours. You know, I'm like, this is an amazing trailer. Why don't we talk more about that? I, yeah. Well, and I think also if, if there were such a thing as a prepackaged glitter blower, that would be the best, the best simultaneously irritating and non-lethal weapon I can think of. I would not want to be hit by that under any circumstance, but I don't think it would kill you. Uh, just a, a quick, I think, point of fact. It says that the vehicle trailer had been stolen and they saw that trailer being towed by a pickup truck. And then it says later the suspect, whose first name is Aura, which I like a lot, uh, the physical manifestation of her aura. It says that she came out of the truck holding a cordless blower motor packed with glitter. So I, I think that she had the glitter blower the whole time, that it was not in the trailer that she stole. That would be real weird. So you <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying is that the giant glue stick was in the truck, not the trailer. Yes, that that was maybe part of her plan the whole time to spray. Arts and crafts, yeah. Arts yeah. And crafts the cops to death. I get it. I will. I will go <laughs> to our our final headline of the week. Sir Humphrey misses pheasant season to go riding. I enjoyed this so much. I am going to I'm going to read this very quickly because this just delighted me that this even existed as a story. One of Britain's top shoot owners will miss the start of the season because he is riding his horse the length of Britain. As the pheasant shoot season gets underway in the UK, 81 year old Sir Humphrey Tyrell Wakefield, who owns Chillingham Castle in Northumberland, is riding his horse Barack 
named because the horse is half black and half white, <laughs> from John O'Goats to Land's End. I'm going to pause briefly. This is so British aristocrat to be like, but well, this is a good idea. Uh, the, the last president of the United States was, well, he was, uh, he was one of those hybrids, wasn't he? Well, I liked that chap. I'm going to name my, my horse after him. Uh, he began the 900-mile journey on the 14-year-old half Friesian, again, Barack, the half black, half white horse, gelding last month. And he won't only be walking, he'll be trotting and cantering the journey of around 900 miles. He will be simultaneously dictating his extraordinarily colorful memoirs to his secretary, Victoria, to type Victoria. up. Victoria. Victoria. <laughs> to type up as he rides. And uh, he, he will not ride entirely solo. He pitches his tent in fields every evening and a retainer with a horse box turns up each night to cook him supper. I am 100% going to try and bring him on the program <laughs> to talk to him about his memoirs. This guy sounds great. Do you have you heard of a horse box before? Because I still don't know exactly what it is. I don't know. No, I, I mean, it sounds like a thing. It sounds real to me like it like horse box. Oh, yeah. Horse box. Is that the same thing as a saddle or like a saddle bag? Maybe 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 we the, the, the intrepid American pioneer spirit converted the horse box into a saddle bag. That sounds right to me. What surprises me about this story is that, so this guy is, I guess, a really famous, like he's a well-known shooter, like he's a famous pheasant shooter. And but what surprises me most about it is I'm like, I'm reading this and I'm like, if there were ever an old white guy who was into birding, who should have fraud, shot his friend in the face in 2006, <laughs> it should have been this guy. <laughs> this is the guy. Wait, are you Not saying that th this should have been the guy Cheney shot or vice versa? No. No, Dick Cheney should not have gotten in trouble this way. This that that was this guy's shtick to do. Yeah, this, yeah. I mean, a guy who rides a horse that's half black and half white named Obama. Like that's the guy that shoots the friend in the face. Yeah, I and I, I think he's also the kind of guy that would have some very weird ethnic explanation for it. Like, well, yes, I shot him, but he's Cornish. Like he, he's from Cornwall. I mean, come on now, right? Like, I, like it has like some yeah, like some eight thousand year old rivalry with a part of like I, I also a hundred percent suspect this man has very strong thoughts on the Plantagenets dynasty. Like, if we were to bring him in, like he could really wax eloquent on the transition of power from the Tudors to them. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to this guy. Uh, I like that his, the castle that he owns is called Chillingham. That's mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, I think, next door to Netflixum. Uh, Netflix and Chillingham Castle is my is my joke that I offer there. Also, I like that you said John O. Goats, but I it is that is a funny, a more fun name for it. Uh, but I believe it is John O. Groats. You're right. I, you know what? I was actually there this last summer and it is not very impressive. Uh, John O. Groats is uh, I, I, I had a camper van and I drove around the NC 500 in northwest Scotland. And uh, John O. Groats purports to be the northernmost part of Britain. But it's not. The northernmost part of Britain's like a mile and a half east or west. It's just that it's harder to get there. So it's base, It's just an excuse to sell postcards. And you get there and you think you're going to be like at the end of the world. And, and then they're like, you're like, what's that? And they're like, oh, that's that's uh, that's the next island. And you're like, really? And it's just, yeah, it's very, very uh, anticlimactic. But you're right. John O'Groats. Um, I also I like shout out to the guy who who requires his secretary to go horse riding with him so that he could dictate his memoirs to her as he rides on a horse. <laughs> Might he be doing it over the phone? Um, I got the impression. Hold on. Let's see. I imagined I read that a few times as well. I imagined that he had that she walks behind him on a rope. <laughs> Like, like, she, like, yeah. There's a velvet rope. Either like she's been captured, or they're in a parade. One of the two. It like e e either in a very servile or a triumphantly servile capacity. But either way, you would know who the person dictating the memoirs is. It says oh. that she's typing these up as he writes. So maybe she's in like um maybe there's like wheels on this thing, and so she's got a little. She's like a stenographer. I hope she is on a smaller donkey named after an another American president. And she has an old timey typewriter and a lot of paper. <laughs> and and is, sitting to the side. She yeah. can't sit this way. She has to sit to the side. Yeah, but clink, 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 bring. And that's how they're doing this. That is uh, Victoria, this. Victoria, chapter five. <laughs> and if you do have uh, a secretary or an assistant with you on a rope, you want to make sure that it's the right person who wants to be at the end of that rope mm -hmm. and that they didn't move away to 30 miles elsewhere and uh, the wrong people showed up. Nice. He did it. Perfect. You did a callback to bring it all back together. 
I did perfect. what I did. Wonderful. Well, I will. Uh, I can't come up with a better conclusion than that. Uh, Mike Kaplan, thank you so much. It's good to see you, my friend. It's good to be funny with you. And and, and your uh, as always, your your optimism is is absolutely infectious. I, I literally think I am a. Uh, a, a more positive person than since we when you and I met, uh, and uh, and your album is AKA. That's right. Wonderful, uh, Dana. It is a pleasure to see you again. You are hey. so smart and so funny. I am so glad that you've Thank got to be you. on the podcast, both as a thinker and academic, and as a comedian. It is a, a rare feat that you have absolutely soared to. Well, thank you so much. My, I have to say, I really enjoyed, because I'm a humor scholar, so I really enjoyed as Mike made every joke, and then he identified the jokes that he made. <laughs> that was my favorite part of this, I, this process. Really took the bricks out of the briefcase. If you love me being funny without planning it, you might love me being funny with having planned it. And I now my favorite part about our interaction, I loved all of it, but that you are a, can you describe briefly what a humor scholar is or can we talk about it another time? You can actually go back and listen to the mm -hmm. episode that I think was released in March. Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, or February, I don't remember. Where we talk about my book and we talk about humor scholarship and actually, Andrew gives me a new word that I was unaware of, even as a humor scholar. It was the the, the concept of studying humor or oh, like gelatology. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Heaton. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's it's a commendable episode. I, I got really good positive feedback on that data. People liked it, and, and I was like, oh, I really want to bring her back on, and I have accomplished Yay. it. Well done, me. Uh, and uh, Dana, if people want to follow you, you are on Twitter. You have uh, your your book uh, on irony and outrage is out. Uh, and uh, and you're on Twitter, and you also do sport, uh, imp, imp, sports improv, comedy sports, comedy sports. Okay. Yes, Philadelphia. Yeah, improv. And I also have a show. I've been doing an interview show called Doctor Young on Packs with various political scientists and communication scholars. So that's online, and my Twitter handle is at Danagal because, as we discussed, I'm the only one. Wonderful, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.